Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the senior publishing director at Word on Fire. We just passed the 60th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council. Six decades later, however, can we say that the council was a success? Or was it a failure? Or was it something in between? Lots of people are discussing the relevance and the continued impact of the Second Vatican Council, and we'll continue that conversation today with Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, good to be with you. Hey, Brandon. Always nice to see you. I want to ask you something that I always love to ask you, but I haven't done it in a while. Namely, what books are you reading? Tell us any good stuff you've been into lately. Um, wait, I, I read a lot of books at the same time. Uh, I'm reading uh, Matt Levering's book that we just published, Word on Fire, on Newman on uh, Doctrinal Corruption. Uh, typical Levering book, really good, thorough, serious scholarship. And then he and I both love Newman, so I'm reading that. I'm continuing with, um, what's his first name? Is it P Peter Adamson? The uh, Historian of Philosophy. Uh, you ordered a lot of those books for me. Uh, I think I'm, I'm still on the ancient philosophy. I read his one on medieval philosophy. It's a history. It's called Philosophy Without Gaps. So he's like, covering absolutely everybody. But I'm enjoying that. Um, I just finished John McGreevy's book on the history of Catholicism from the French Revolution to uh, modern times. And it's good. It's a, it's a very common wheel, Notre Dame sort of center left take on, on those issues. So read them in tandem, let's say, with uh, George Weigel on Vatican II, and you get, you know, it's kind of center left versus center right. Just finish that. Um, what else? I'm I'm going to get to Chesterton on Aquinas and, and Francis, because I'm getting ready for the Chesterton uh, meeting next summer. They asked me to speak on the uh, on St. Francis book, right? So you sent that to me. I'm going to bring that with me to um, uh, Chicago on my next trip. Anyway, those are a few things I'm reading. How about, I know when you were in California, you were driving so much, and one of the things you would do is listen to Audible books. You got any, yeah. anything going on Audible these you days? Know, I'm doing that less, because I I haven't had as many of those super long trips, uh, but there was, what was it? There was something I was listening to. Oh, I know, I know. Um, I got The Diary of a Country Priest by uh, Georges Bernanos which I had tried to read many years ago and kind of got bogged down in it, frankly. So I've got that in my car, and, and I was uh, uh, plowing. Oh, and also, I got the Constellation of Philosophy, Boethius, which I, I will confess to you, I'm a you know, master's degree in philosophy, love, but I had never read Boethius. I never read the Constellation of Philosophy, so I'm, I'm listening to that in the car. It's got the whole Wheel of Fortune thing, which you talk about right. often. That comes from Boethius, yeah. right? Yeah, indeed, right. All right, well, let's turn from books to the Second Vatican Council. Again, the, the Second Vatican Council opened officially on October 11th, 1962, which means we just passed the 60th anniversary of its convening. As expected, there have been lots of articles, commentary reflecting back on the council, both pro and con, uh, and its continued relevance. But I have noticed within the past year a surprising number of these reflections questioning whether the council was, in fact, a net positive for the church, whether it was better than worse for the church. And I'm thinking in particular of, of two recent articles that have gotten a lot mm -hmm. of commentary by our friend Ross Douthit. Ross has been yeah. a friend of Word on Fire for years, and he uh, actually appeared in one of our films, right? The New Evangelization documentary from yeah, several years fine. ago. Um, but Ross is a op-ed writer for the New York Times, and he recently had two op-ed pieces, one titled how Catholics became prisoners of Vatican II, and then a follow-up piece titled, How Vatican II Failed Catholics and Catholicism. And I wanted to talk through both of those articles with you. All right, in the first piece, Douthat says this, quote, the council poses a continuing challenge. It creates intractable, intractable seeming divisions, and it leaves contemporary Catholicism facing a set of problems and dilemmas that providence has not yet seen fit to resolve. He then lists three of these, three statements that to him encapsulate the problems and dilemmas of Vatican II. The first one is this, the council was necessary. He says the church of 1962 needed significant adaptation, significant rethinking and reform. These adaptations needed to be backward looking, so getting away from throne and altar politics, the rise of modern liberalism, and the horror of the Holocaust, all of which required response from the church. 
but they also needed to be forward-looking in the sense that Catholicism in the early 1960s had only just begun to reckon with globalization and decolonization and the information age and social revolutions touched off by the invention of the contraceptive pill. So let's stop there and get your thoughts on that, that first statement. Would you agree that the council was necessary in the first place? Well, I say yes, and rely not so much on my own judgment, but that of those who were involved. Um, almost everybody who mattered around that time thought the church needed something. I go back to uh, Urs von Balthasar and the famous Raising of the Bastions book he wrote in the 1950s. Uh, that sums up the attitude of a lot of people at mid-20th -sun mid century Catholicism, that we were too defensive, that we were kind of crouching behind our own medieval walls, that our, our philosophical system was sort of arcane and outdated, and that to engage the modern world, which is a major concern of, of Vatican II, to engage the modern world, certain adjustments and so on in our in our thinking and, and our practice had to happen. You know, I had the privilege, Brandon, when I was a young priest, there were still a number of priests around who uh, knew Vatican II very well. One of them was a good friend of mine, Monsignor Bill Quinn of Happy Memory. Bill was, was at Vatican II. I won't go into all the reasons why, but he was a liaison between the uh, Latin American Bishops' Conference and our Bishops' Conference. So Bill knew all the players, and he was there for the sessions of Vatican II. And, and Bill would have been raised completely in the Preconciliar Church. He was ordained about 1940. Knew it, loved it, loved all the truth and goodness and beauty of Catholicism, loved Dante, Aquinas, Chartres Cathedral, the whole bit, right? But Bill would have said to me, you know, we desperately needed changes. We had to make adjustments so the church could do its mission. Second sort of empirical observation, look at the votes. Whenever people kind of either question the legitimacy of Vatican II or the needfulness of it, here's by far the most ecumenical council in the history of the church, meaning the, the one that represented the, the largest swath of populations and countries ever. You know, you got east to west, all over the world, people are there, Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, North America, they're all there. Look at the votes, look at the votes, overwhelmingly in favor of a conciliar document. Obviously, the vast, vast majority of the key leaders of the church at that time felt that these changes in tone, in behavior, in some degree in thinking had to happen, right? So there, I would say, yeah, the empirical evidence is clear. Uh, I trust the people who were there at the time. They judged that it was necessary. So Douthat continues that um, just because a moment calls for reinvention doesn't mean that a specific set of reinventions will succeed. And he says, we now have decades of data to justify a second encapsulating statement. And here it is. The council was a failure. So that's Douthat's second claim. He adds, this isn't a truculent or reactionary analysis. The Second Vatican Council failed on the terms that its own supporters set. It was supposed to make the church more dynamic, more attractive to modern people, more evangelistic, less closed off and stale and self-referential. It did none of those things. The church declined everywhere in the developed world after Vatican II, under conservative and liberal popes alike, but the decline was swiftest where the council's influence was strongest. Would you agree with that claim, that the council was That's, a failure? No, I wouldn't put it that way. But I, I want to give him his full due there. Um, I think it was George Weigel some years ago raised that question about any council, that you can say, okay, there's the council, the documents, and the teachings, and of course, you know, we believe in the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so you can't say these councils are saying, you know, heretical things. But nevertheless, you can ask, was it successful? Think of the famous Lateran Council just before the Reformation. That's everyone holds up as the most famous example of a council that clearly failed, because what followed immediately after was the Protestant Reformation, you know. So, yeah, a council can fail. It can fail to achieve what it wanted to achieve. And I'll give Douthat his, his full due there. Uh, I've said it for years, following Cardinal George and others, it was a missionary council. 
meant to bring us out into the modern world in an evangelically compelling way. It wanted to bring more people back to Mass. It wanted to revitalize the Mass. It wanted to bring people to the source and summit of the Christian life. Moreover, it wanted ecumenical um, unity. Th that's a major concern. Read Congar's diaries. Read De Lubach. Read all the major players at Vatican II. Read Ratzinger. They, they wanted desperately to bring the, the riven body of Christ together. Uh, all good and noble things articulated beautifully in the documents? Yeah, I would say. Now, here's Douthat giving him his due. Did any of that happen? Frankly, no. Now, now, mind you, in the West, in the West, we're looking at Europe and North America, Australia. You know, we've noticed that this radical disaffiliation, we've noticed people leaving the church in droves. They're, they're not coming back to Mass, they're, they're walking away from Mass. They're not coming to the Eucharist, they're abandoning the Eucharist. 70% of our own people don't believe in the real presence. Ecumenism, we're certainly nicer to each other, which is a no small thing. Don't get me wrong, it's no small thing that we're not hurling anathema at each other. But, you know, have, has the body of Christ come together? No, in fact, the Protestant mainstream churches have kind of drifted off into secularism. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll grant him a, a fair amount there that, um, you know, the jury's out. Let's put it that way. The jury's out. Knowing, too, that the church takes a very long view. Let's say you had asked after Nicaea. So Nicaea is 325. If you, 60 years later, 385, hey, was Nicaea a failure? most thoughtful people at the time probably would have said, you bet it was, because look at us. You know, the, the post-Nicene period is marked by extraordinary division in the life of the church. Not about trivial matters, about Christology. Who is Jesus Christ? Look at St. Athanasius, forced not one, not two, but three times into exile. Uh, much of the Christian world under the leadership of Arian bishops. So 60 years after Nicaea, Success or failure? I think most people would say, boy, it's been a failure. What do we say now? Well, I mean, we recite the Nicene Creed every single Sunday at Mass because it was such a resounding success. My point there is we think in centuries. We take a very long view. Will in time the fruits of Vatican II be on clearer display? Yeah, yeah, possibly. Here's something else, Brandon, I want to throw into the mix. Maybe the question is posed the wrong way. What if we pose it this way? Why was there, at least in the West, such a resistance to Vatican II? Here's the church calling, calling us good things, right? Evangelization, reaching out to the modern world, drawing people back to Mass, bringing them back to the Bible. The, the role of the laity in the world to transform the, the society. All good things, right? So how come they were resisted? How come they were resisted? In other words, maybe I'll shift the question. Don't blame the council. Boy, that council, what a mistake it was or what a failure it was. How about, look, and I'm bishops, priests, lay people. How come we resisted it? Look at the way the left today resists Vatican II. They don't want to read them documents of Vatican II. They want Vatican IV, right? The conservatives, they don't want to read Vatican II. Vatican II was a was an outrage and it was it was a heretical, you know, um, uh, outburst. So why are we resisting Vatican II? Why in the West did we not listen to these great texts? Now, we could explore lots of reasons. I, I, I'll give you two. Uh, very bad implementation in the West and these huge cultural shifts, especially the sexual revolution that swept through the church, that led an awful lot of Catholics to say, nope, I'm done with Catholicism, you know? So I, I, let me just throw that into the hopper, maybe as a challenge to Ross Douthat, that perhaps that's the wrong way to, to ask the question. Is the council a success or a failure? How come we resisted it? <laughs> How come it's been so thoroughly resisted by both left and right? Uh, and when will we Catholics get with the darn program? You know, maybe that's a better way to, to think about it. 
whenever I talk with my friends about the effectiveness of Vatican II, and these are mostly American friends, so we're seeing it through the lens of the West, um, I, I often see them making two what I consider to be very serious mistakes in their judgment of the council. One is the yeah. post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy right. that if something right. happened after Vatican II, it was because right. of Vatican II. Um, but right. then the other thing is you hinted at this, the limited lens of seeing the effectiveness on yeah. the council on America or the West without considering the church is a universal church. And as you said, in, in Africa and Asia especially, the church boomed post-Vatican II. And I would argue yeah. and because of Vatican II. Vatican II was the key that unleashed this evangelical energy in those countries, and that without it, I'm not sure we would have seen that explosive growth. Would you agree with, with it, those two things? It's very fair, it seems to me. And Africa is the great example. Um, go on YouTube. You can see all kinds of uh, images of liturgies and processions and masses and prayers going on in Africa with extraordinary devotion. Mind you, in light of our last conversation, what's the great exception to this demographic uh, winter going on? Africa, Africa, where people are reproducing <laughs> like mad, having big families. Well, again, the correlation between vibrant faith in God and big families. Um, and they're not, may I just observe, they're not celebrating the traditional Latin mass in Africa. They're celebrating the Novus Ordo mass with all of its use of the vernacular, involvement of the people, um, inculturation, et cetera, et cetera. And look at the church booming and flourishing there. Uh, we are much more of a Southern and Brown church now. And that's very important for those of us who are kind of in the commentariat in the Western world. And so we wring our hands all the time about what's going on in Germany and Holland and England and America and Australia. Well, that's in some ways, that's the, that's the old church. The, the fresh young church is Southern and it's Brown. And it is indeed flourishing there. And yes, it's the church of, of Vatican II. So I think that's a very important thing. To your first point, I often used it when I taught at Mundelein. And I would teach the guys the, the logical fallacies, you know, and when I would do post hoc ergo propter hoc, which by the way means uh, coming after, therefore, because of, you know. Um, I would always use the example of Vatican II. That was my example, is, is all the time people say, oh, well, look what's happened. Look at this terrible decline that happened after 1965. Well, therefore, it's because of the council. Um, that's right, a logical fallacy. Now, I, I don't want to be brushing aside these critiques, though, as I say. I, I want to give Ross his full due. And that that's a fair question. That's a fair question. Uh, if we were a missionary council, and let's say you got the you got the board of directors <laughs> saying, okay, brothers, here, here's what we decided we were going to accomplish, and here's how we set about doing it. How are we doing? What's the honest answer? And and we should give honest answers. And maybe it does call for some, you know, um, redirection or or it calls some rethinking. Okay. Also, though, that instinct that I had earlier with you is turn the question around. How come we resisted it? How come we've been resisting Vatican II for so long? Again, we're talking about a couple of new op-ed articles by Ross Douthit in the New York Times on the 60th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. Ross had three summary statements that encapsulated what he considers to be the problems and dilemmas of Vatican II. The first one was that the council was necessary. The second one was the council was a failure. We just talked about that. Let's look at the third one now. He says, no one can evade the third reality. The council cannot be undone. By this, he says, I don't mean that the Mass can never return to Latin or that various manifestations of post-conciliar Catholicism are inevitable. I just mean that there is no simple path back, not to the kind of thick inherited Catholic cultures that still existed down to the middle of the 20th century, not to the moral and doctrinal synthesis stamped with the promise of infallibility and consistency, he says, even if the council's changes did not officially alter doctrine, to rewrite and renovate so many prayers and practices inevitably made ordinary Catholics wonder why an authority that suddenly declared itself to have been misguided across so many different fronts could still be trusted to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ himself. Well, there's a lot there, actually. We do a whole show on, on each of those. 
the last one, I don't know if that's the case, that that because of some of these changes, let's say at the level of of practice and so on, we lost all credibility. I, I don't know if that's the case. Uh, I, I fully get, you know, think of Mary Douglas, the great English sociologist who commented balefully on the um, the change in the Friday fish, you know, re- regulation, that it was such a defining quality of Catholic life that when it just disappeared overnight, it did something to the to the collective psyche of Catholics. Also, I draw attention to the fact that um, many, many priests I know have talked about this. Confession didn't gradually fade away. Confession fell off a cliff. It was going strong and then boom, it simply stopped. So th- there is something there where we can, maybe we mishandled the way those things were done and it produced in people's psyches uh, 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 turmoil. You know, I, I, I can see that. But I don't know if you say the church's credibility across the board was thereby undermined. Um, I, you know, I think of, I, I go back to my, my mother, I was, you know, was not a theologically reflective person, but uh, I said to her when, this is a few years ago, I said, you know, mom, we, would you ever want to go back to the mass the way it was? And the first, what, 50 years of her life were, were spent in the old mass. And she said, oh, no, 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 I, I like the mass the way it is. You know, I, I, I like, I understand what's going on. And so it's kind of a, it was a simple uh, response of a very devout, you know, pious Catholic. I don't think that change led my mother to say, "I no longer believe in the in the authority of the church, or the church can't speak to you know moral and doctrinal issues." I think she she kind of took that in stride, you know. So I, I don't know how far I'd really push that issue. I think he's dead right about we can't go back. Think of Cardinal George here again. He used to say, sometimes conservatives make the mistake of identifying Catholicism with a particular mid-20th century form of Catholicism. Um, There was, let's say in our country, the the vibrant Catholic parish with the priests and four priests, the rectory and the nuns in the school and and a, a certain integrated form of life. Yeah, okay, which was a product of all sorts of cultural and religious uh, influences. Do we simply identify that's Catholicism? That's what it was and we lost it. As opposed to no, Catholicism, again, this would be Cardinal George. It's it's the sacraments. It's the Eucharist. It's Jesus Christ proclaimed. It's apostolic authority. It's the the witness of of the Pope. It's the saints. It's Catholic art and architecture. That's Catholicism. It's not necessarily mid-20th century American or mid 20th century French or Canadian Catholicism. So I think that's right when he says we, we can't or shouldn't think about going back before uh, the council. The, the world has so moved on and shifted and the church not taking the world as a, as a criterion, that's certainly a mistake, but the, the church has to engage the world all the time. You know, we can't just go back and say, well, no, we're going to stay in this, this now defunct cultural form. No, we have to be in in engagement with the culture that's actually there. So I quite agree with that. No, there's no going back behind it. Reminds me of that other Cardinal George quote that you that you often mention where he says, in the beginning of the church's life, there were no yeah. parishes, dioceses, institutions, right. but there were evangelists and saints. And, but there were yeah. evangelists, right. And so that's the essential element. And so and he read the council that way. The council was to awaken an evangelical spirit. Now, to be fair, did that happen, in fact? Did that happen? Or, the way I rephrase the question, why didn't we cooperate with that? <laughs> you know, Why did we want to turn Vatican II into something else? Oh, no, no, I, I don't want to hear the, the gospel in a fresh way. I want to change you know, X, Y, and Z. Or, no, I don't want to hear the gospel in a fresh way. I want to go back to the way it was. So how come we resisted it? You know, I'll put the onus on, on us. Let's close with Ross Douthat's closing of his articles. He says, ultimately, the business of the Catholic Church is to save souls, to serve Jesus Christ, and to manifest the presence of God through its holiness and beauty. And as I said in my first column, I'll say it again, what really breeds cynicism is when the Church behaves like the Soviet Empire in its dotage and demands (laughs) constant enconiums to the wisdom and success of a now decades-old renewal project when everyone, Douthat says, can plainly see that it's presiding over crisis and decline. 
Um, is that a fair critique? And how, how would you no, it, how would you it, assess the effectiveness of Vatican II sixty years after its opening? Well, here, here's the thing. First of all, I, it, to refer to Vatican II as a renewal project, like it's something you know, a new a new program we adopted in our parish. Uh, no, it's an ecumenical council of the church, which means the church operating at the highest possible level of its authority. An ecumenical council under the leadership of a pope. So to, to characterize Vatican II as a renewal project is, is the wrong way to think about it. I get the Soviet thing because I remember those days when the, the ancient Soviet leadership would be trotted out on the, on the you know, balcony and they would wave like this and, and every, oh, it's everything we're doing so well. You know, in fact, the whole thing was crumbling around them. So I get that. It's, it's funny, you know. And so I would say, no, don't treat Vatican II as a renewal project, but but to give him his due again, sure, I think we can and should ask those hard questions about what did and didn't work and why. Uh, why was Vatican II not properly received and implemented? It might be the way I'd put it. Um, and I think it's good for us bishops to keep asking that question. And, and not to live in a fantasy land of, oh, wasn't Vatican II just you know, supremely wonderful in every way and in all of its effects? No, I think we should always be realistic. A, a basic principle of mine is whatever gets you in touch with being is getting you more in touch with God because God is being itself, right? So whenever you start living in fantasy worlds, and that's what he means with the Soviet thing is, you know, everything's fine. Just ignore the chaos behind me. Well, that's you're getting far away from God. And so, sure, we church leaders and, and all church people should ask those questions. How come, I've often said this, Brandon, you know, that this this dream of Vatican II has not yet come true. And, and I've said this about the role of the laity. I've said it about the biblical renewal. I've said it about liturgical renewal. I've said it about the renewal of the moral life, moral teaching. I, I think all of those, they've not yet come true. Okay, okay, why not? Fair enough. That's a good question. That's a fair question. But I, I, I wouldn't want to write the council off as a failed renewal project. I, I think because then we're going to dismiss it too, uh, too cavalierly. Well, it's time now for a question from one of our listeners. Today we have a question from Michael. He's in Detroit, Michigan. He's asking about the transfiguration event of Jesus' life. Here's his question. Hi, Bishop Barron. This is Michael from Detroit, Michigan. My question is about the transfiguration of Jesus. If God is the invisible God and doesn't have form and is outside of the universe, then what was Jesus transfigured into uh, in the Synoptic Gospels? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's it's you're raising an important Christological question. The two natures in Jesus come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. That's the Council of Chalcedon, meaning God doesn't turn into a creature, and a creature doesn't turn into God, but rather the two natures, divine and human, without losing their their proper integrity, come together in the unity of a person. So there's the basic Christological point. In the Transfiguration, the the word used there in the Greek is literally metamorphosis that he goes meta beyond the morphe, the form. So something in his physical form changed. He, he went beyond the normal way that he appeared. The, the Bible speaks of, of his clothes becoming dazzlingly white and his face and so on. The light of Tabor, the theologians talk about. So whatever that was, it was a change in the visible aspect of his humanity. So it wouldn't be affecting his divinity. It wouldn't be as though he's turning into the invisible God. It's his the physical form of his humanity was metamorphosed. It it appeared now in a in a in a heightened way. That, that's I think what happened on Tabor. Well thanks for your excellent question, Michael. And for the rest of you who are listening, if you have a question you'd like to ask Bishop, we always are Welcome to receive them. You can send them at askbishopbaron.com. Well, as we wrap up here, I want to encourage those listening, if you have not yet read the documents of Vatican II, now would be a good time to do it. We're 60 years after the anniversary of the opening of the Council, and at Word on Fire, we created a book with the intention of helping people to read and understand its documents. We call it the Word on Fire Vatican II Collection. 
You can find it at the website wordonfire.org slash Vatican II. Also on that website, you'll find all of Bishop Barron's videos and articles about the Second Vatican Council to take you even deeper. And I also wanted to mention, as we near the holy season of Lent, that we are releasing a new booklet called Reflections on the Passion of Our Lord. It's a week-by-week guide of reflections on Lenten themes like death, temptation, repentance, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, the Passion of Christ. It features passages from Scripture, extended readings from Bishop Barron, along with hymns, poetry, prayers, and additional reflections across 2,000 years of the Catholic tradition. So it's the perfect guide for individuals, families, and especially parishes to use during the seasons of Lent and Easter. Again, it's called Reflections on the Passion of Our Lord, and I'll include a link to both of those books here in the show notes. Well, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Word on Fire show.